Welcome to the Business Family Marriage Podcast with Tim Smoyer. This is his personal podcast where he shares what he's learning about growing a seven-figure business while also raising seven children and deepening his relationship with his wife at the same time. He shares what he's learning, what's worked, what hasn't, what he's trying next to grow a fruitful business, family, and marriage. For more on that today, here's Tim. Well, hello, parents, business owners, entrepreneurs, married people. Good to have you here uh, for my my personal podcast where I just talk about things I'm learning in my business, in my marriage, in my family, and especially how all those things kind of impact each other. And today, it's like a perfect opportunity, place to share this, this content. Uh, last week, I spoke at... Uh, an event up at Ball State University in Indiana for their Faith at Work event. And uh, I was asked to ask uh, to talk about, Tim, what impact does your faith have on your work? And what impact does your work have on your faith? And I had to think about that for a little bit. Not, not so much on the impact my faith has on my work. That one, I think, it was that one's pretty easy. That's been a pretty integrated part of my business, even from the very beginning, and, and who I am, and how I spend my time, and things. But how does our work impact our faith? That was a different one for me to think about. Is my faith different, or change, or my beliefs change, or impacted based on my work? So I had to do some uh, deep introspection on that one, and and went to these students and these professors and faculty members and things at Ball State University, and uh, I, I I was given permission to record my my presentation, which I want to share with you guys here today. Uh, and there's a link in the show notes of this episode or down in the description if you're watching the video version on YouTube where I want to hear your questions to this. Uh, There was a a good time of Q&A after this this, uh, conversation, after this presentation. Uh, A lot of good questions from the audience in terms of like, well, how do you have your faith but also be professional? And how do you um, actually like move things forward? And and how do you manage relationships when people think you should be one way but you need to actually be this other way? And uh, in terms of like being, you know, honest with people about performance and things like that. So a lot of good, a lot of good discussions. And if you have some of your questions at the end of this, use the link in the show notes to send me an audio voicemail. And I'd love to respond to them in an upcoming episode here and, and just think through some of this stuff together. So yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts and let's get into the recording of how my faith impacts my work and my work impacts my faith. And especially What difference does all that make in our family and in my life, in our business, like the intersection of all those things? Excited to hear what you think. Let's jump into it. I was asked, Jeff's like, hey, could you talk about faith at work? We had a call, what, a few months ago or something, and and he's just like, wow, this sounds like exactly what our people need to hear and love to talk about it. And so I'm like, faith at work? Wow, okay, let me, I'm like, what does that look like? Is that, is this what that looks like? I'm like, is it like people standing around at work, like praying and like having a Bible study before, before work, or is it like, you know, finding the stack of like sticky notes and Bible verses and posting them all over the bathroom walls? Is it like, what is, what is this? Is it like just telling people about your faith and having to bring it up in some really awkward way? Is it just making sure you pray in front of people? Like, what is this faith at work thing? Or it's like, maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it's like, it's like this undercover mission where no one knows that you're a Christian and then you just like pop up and surprise people in the most vulnerable moment. Like, maybe that's what it is. I don't know. Is it like a bait and switch? So I hope that hopefully by the end of our time together, uh, we'll have figured some of this out by sharing some of my story, what that looks like, um, where I think that faith can actually and is actually our biggest asset as we are going into the workforce, working with clients, growing businesses, and hopefully we can ever undercover that, some of that here together. Um, so yeah, I did go to Dallas Theological Seminary, went to Bible college. I thought that, you know, growing up as a pastor's kid myself, my, my, my dad was a pastor my entire life, and I thought, like, the way you impact the world is by going into full-time ministry. If you really want to be, like, a good Christian, and you want, you really want to have a big impact on people's lives, like, go into full-time ministry, because there people will pay you to talk with them about Jesus, which was like, 
sign me up. That's a good deal, right? Until I found out how much it paid, and I was like, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, so it was, it was like, I was like, I'm going to go there. And so I went to Bible college and went to, to seminary. And while I was in seminary, I uploaded my very first video to YouTube. This is it. Uh, it's 30 seconds long, just one take. I called it test video. So you know I put a lot of creative energy into this one. <laughs> it was just like, could I just figure out how to get the camera off of, like, back then, um, video cameras used magnetic tape. And so I was like, how could I get it? Maybe some of you remember, I don't know. But like, it was an eight millimeter camera. Like, could I just get it off of this camera and onto this thing called YouTube? Because I was dating this girl um, and uh, wanted to introduce her to my family back home. And so I found out, okay, I can do this. I can get video off my camera. Let's just go out on dates. Let's go out to, go out to eat, go out to movies, go out to the park. And like, let's just make videos of that. Today, we would know those as vlogs. But back then, it was just called being public or being awkward in public <laughs> with a camera. And so we would make these little videos and, and post them. And something weird, something strange started happening. <clears throat> I was just doing it because I could send the link to my family and friends back home. But then, but then I was like, wait, other people are watching. And I'm like, wait, why, how are they finding me? Why are they coming? Who is Catlicker72? And should I be concerned that they're like watching my videos right now? <laughs> like, like, what is going on? What, and uh, MySpace was big back then, and everything I was hearing on MySpace, if anyone remembers that, is like, you don't use your real name on the internet. If you do, people will hunt you down and kill you for some reason. <laughs> and so I was getting really concerned about what is going on. How are the people finding me? Why do they keep coming back? And why do they keep watching? Why are they commenting? And I was like, I don't know. There's only me and two other guys. Uh, so three was total at that time, uh, back in 2005, uh, 2006, and 2007. We're like trying to figure out how does this thing work? Like, and, and YouTube themselves didn't even know how it worked. So nobody really knew. There was no online video industry yet or anything. It was just us trying to figure out how this platform was working. Well, um, my girlfriend and I kept going. We kept making videos, and we ended up putting everything up there from our, our engagement <clears throat> to our honeymoon, or our wedding, to our honeymoon, first real job, first house, and all that. And around that time, we were, we were reaching around a million people a month on YouTube, which back then was unheard of. Like back today, that's not, that's pretty common. But back then, that was like ridiculous. And so I was getting more questions, like, how are you doing this? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure it out. And, uh, and uh, I, what I really loved about it as a, as a youth pastor at the time is I really love teenagers. I love serving their families. And uh, my wife and I, uh, mostly me, she came along for the ride, took a job at, at a church up in Minnesota in a really small, small town. And everything that I loved there was happening. I, it was like people, the, the youth group was growing. Like Jeff said, it went from uh, 18 when I got there to, to about 180 coming every week uh, um, to, our, uh, to our meetings and uh, loved these kids. We were pouring into them. We were seeing life change happen and, uh, and, and, and we just loved it. I have my annual review and five out of five stars, no room for improvement, everything's great, no recommendations. And then I'm called into this surprise board meeting and um, everyone's kind of lined up behind this folding table and there's me in the middle of the room. I'm like, this is different, you know? And uh, some of you guys know where this is going. Yeah, did not end well for me. Um, it was a long process, but um, I was fired after working there for about five years. And it wasn't just me, it was about nine other people as well. But it was, uh, it was a big mess. And, Got my four weeks of severance, and which expired on Christmas Day of that year. And when most families were out opening presents and enjoying good food and spending time with family, we were sitting there on Christmas Day trying to figure out how we're gonna pay rent the next month and make everything stretch. Thankfully, we had at that time two little kids and so we were eligible for some child government assistance programs for food and so we thankfully took advantage of that and it was humiliating for my wife the way that she was treated by people in the checkout line the people in line behind her with sighs and like uh, and groan because this was going to take a longer time to check out because we got to use these government checks to get this food and, and everything and um and it was a really challenging time time for us. Um, so I started looking for other youth groups at that time. Um, I didn't really have much. I, all my degrees and stuff were in Bible and theology, you know, 
not very practical skills outside of a church setting. And, uh, and I'm like, what, what am I going to do next? Like, in, the, in most youth ministry positions, they usually hire around, around Christmas time, or I'm sorry, ra- rather in the fall. And so I had just, like usually when the school year, um, like after all the summer camps are over, that's like usually the high turnover time for youth pastors is right before the new school year starts. So um, I had just missed that boat. And so the only thing I had was this blog and this YouTube channel. And the blog had grown into, like you said, the most widely read blog on the internet and youth ministry space online. And so that was, that was cool. I started selling advertising on that. Um, started doing, getting, getting some book advances to um, publish some books. And, um, and so we were hobbling together piece by piece. And, um, but I was also at that time training people like, here's what I'm learning about YouTube. And here's what works, here doesn't, here's what doesn't work. And this was what, like, what you should try if you wanna grow and get to the next level. And so as I was uh, doing that, I got this phone call. <clears throat> this is the actual phone call because um, we were vlogging everything back then. So I have screenshots of a lot of our life. And this guy, uh, Jeremy, he calls me. He's like, hey, I keep bumping into you on the Internet for your YouTube stuff or your youth ministry stuff. And like, he's like, who are you? <laughs> and so we had this conversation. He's like, hey, if you're looking for a job, um, I own a video production agency here in Cincinnati, and we're looking for someone who can come help our clients with their YouTube strategy because YouTube's starting to gain momentum. And so, after two years of of working for my own and just try, on my own and trying to scrap everything together, I was like, "All right, I'll take it." So I got there. It was great for a year, and at the end of a year, they're like, "Tim, we love you, but like you've done a great job for us here, but." Our company is no longer going to be offering strategy to our clients. We're going a different direction. And you have six months. At the end of six months, you're going to be without a job. And I was like, <laughs> I just moved my family across the country for this. So very different experience from getting fired. They're like, we think you should start this business. Come use our Wi-Fi. Come use our resources. Like, let us help you because there's something here. And I was like, okay. So six months, um, I knew my job was going to end on June 15th, 2013. And I'm like, I got to get YouTube from zero to a full-time income in six months. Right? Like we had, and back then there wasn't really a big partner program like it is now. So people are making way more money on advertising and stuff now than they were back then. So uh, I knew I needed a different business model to make it sustainable. And so I had six months, and at the end of six months, um, I, 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 that job was over, and then I was making some money, but not much. That same night, I had a call with a guy, and he's like, uh, I need you. He's like, and. Um, And he ended up giving me contracts to do YouTube strategy for Disney. I did the Batman release for Warner Brothers. I did eBay. I did Budweiser. I did HBO. Like all these big brands. And I was like, wow, this went went from zero to something really quickly, right? And so after that, I was making about $10,000 a month. And I was like... I should have quit my job a long time ago. <laughs> you know, this is paying way better than that was, than that was paying. And, uh, and so I was in my basement, just in this corner of this little 700 square foot house, uh, working, we had uh, three kids now at, this, at that time, and I'm just trying to make this thing work. So I, I start learning what a business model is, and I, start, I create my own channel, and within six months, yeah, I was generating uh, $10,000 a month. And that, today, that business is still, uh, it's, larger now. It's me and a small team of us. But um, we have, yeah, what I really loved about YouTube was that what I saw happening from what my wife and I were doing on YouTube, we're reaching about a million people a month. I was hearing more stories of life change and impact coming out of that effort on YouTube than I ever saw in 12 years of vocational youth ministry. I'm not necessarily trying to dog the church, but I am saying that like, God might, God was leading me in a different direction. He's like, Tim, 180, it looks cool, it's great, but that's, that's not it. And, and it was like literally like a million a month. And we were hearing stories of like, of mar- we got emails from like one lady, this email sends out to me, and she's, she's like, hey, you don't know me, I've been watching you guys on YouTube. Um, I just got married two months ago. I don't know if we're gonna make it. We're already struggling in our relationship. But then I watched that video of you and your wife just talking about how you're learning to love each other better. I shared that video with my husband. We talked about it and just want to let you know that we have hope again for our marriage. Just thank you for that. I'm like, that happened from our video? You know, you have people who didn't commit suicide. You have, uh, another girl was like, 
Um, I didn't grow up with a mom. She left me when I was little, but I've been watching your videos for a few years now, and I think because I've been watching your videos, I'm now getting married soon, and I think I know what it takes to be a good mom and a good wife one day. Like, because I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, so all these stories, and people who are like, who had left church but were considering it again because they were just watching this pastor um, on camera for a while, their curiosity and, um, and, all, and, all, and all this stuff was like happening. So I was like, I think if I'm supposed to look at where God is working and join him in that, like I think there's, there's something here. So um, what I really love about what we do now is like, I was like, if, I can, if I'm having this type of impact with reaching my million, what would happen if I could help other people reach their million, all right? And so my business and I, we set this goal we're like, there's about 7 billion people on the planet. What if we could like help peop other creators who have messages to spread that could reach people and change lives? What if we could help them collectively get to about 7 billion? Like that would be like every person on the planet could have a touch point with a message that could change their life. In business world, they call it a BHAG. It's your big, hairy, audacious goal. The, the companies that are great companies, according to this guy, Jim Collins, says like these big companies, the, the great companies have these BHAGs. We're like, all right, let's do that. And then we hit it. And I was like, well, shoot, <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> it's like, we reach everyone on the planet, uh, potentially, through our clients. So, so now we're up to 18 billion views and 81 million subscribers. And I'm not really sure how to go bigger, but it just keeps getting bigger. So it's not very inspirational anymore. But yeah, we have a lot of our, our clients are, maybe you've heard of Dr. Mike, uh, Charisma on Command, uh, the King of Random, uh, Dave Ramsey, a lot of um, working with celebrity, Jillian Michaels, Jet Jergensmeyer, Rob Dystra, a lot of reality show stars, um, a lot of big brands, and, uh, including ones I mentioned, but also Twitch, MTV, Amazon, Microsoft, YouTube themselves was a client of ours for a while, which is great. So we, we, I really love this, this, what we're now doing is like business as mission, where it's like my heart for people, my ministry, my pastor shepherd giftedness hasn't changed because I'm outside of a church context. It's just being utilized, in my opinion, in a much more effective way inside of a business that's producing profit, that is serving my team members, like now, now people who are employed by our company are, are like supporting their families too. And together we can link arms around this mission to reach more people, change more lives, and help people do that by, by, by mastering YouTube. By the way, um, yeah, I think I married that girl. We live about two hours away from now. There's our, we somehow managed to have seven kids in eight years. So I don't know. Well, I do know how that happened, but I'm not <laughs> sure that I would like recommended doing that again, but we did it. It was awesome. All those kids, kids are great. So when I, Jeff asked me, like, talk about how your faith impacts your work and then how your work impacts your faith. And there's two main things from, on both of those that I thought I'd introduce you guys to here today. Um, one is my faith impacts my work in terms of our, our core values. And our core values, like these are the things that flow out of who I am and, and how I feel like God's gifted me and shaped me. Um, let me give you a little business lesson here about core values. They're not something that you just put on a board and, or sit at the top of a letterhead and that's pretty much all people think about. <laughs> that's, you know, it kind of gets dismissed. Core values, in my opinion, like they drive everything you do, every decision you make, especially in my case, the people that I hire. My people have to embody, oh, I didn't show you, show you what they are yet. They have to embody these core values. Um, and, and, and all these people, they, it's not just like I agree that these are true, but these things have to be fundamentally true about who you are. It gives identity to your team. Uh, it gives them a framework for how to approach their work. It gives everyone a common language when making decisions. It sets company culture, which is like, what is it like to work here? Uh, it attracts people who share those beliefs and repel, more importantly, repels people who don't share these beliefs. Um, it's aspirational to your team, something we're always striving to become. And, and it starts off as like, okay, I agree, like those are important, but they really have to embody them. It's like our core, like it oozes out of us. And anyone who works with anyone on my team can be like, yeah, those things are true about you guys. So our core values, just real briefly, is, is one is uh, we have three external, three internal um, people first. And this comes out of like my heart to like, we're here to serve people. Like ultimately any business should be about serving people. The revenue, the money is what enables you to continue to serve people, right? It's like a business revolves around this idea that you are solving a problem for something, for someone. They have a problem, they don't really know how to solve it, but they can give you some money and you solve that problem for them, right? Which is, which is great. 
So it has to be people first, not just in, in terms of like, like people think that like video creators is about video, but we're actually about creators. They just happen to be people who make videos, right? And so for us, it's, it's just like, it's about reaching people, it's about changing their lives. We actually care about our clients as individuals. Sometimes we make um, decisions as a company that really aren't good for business from a profitability standpoint, but they're just good for people. It's just like, it's best for that person. It's, it's a people first approach. Results focus, like it's really important to us that what we teach actually works. It's not like one of these things where someone, and this happens a lot on YouTube, but someone's got some good ideas or it worked once or twice and so they make a video, here's how you do it. I'm like, that literally only worked for you in that one case, right? So. For us, it has to be reproducible. It has to get people the results they're looking for. Uh, and then third, we're, we're mission oriented. Like we actually really deeply care about, that's why a lot of our clients work with us. Like we care about their mission, what they're trying to do. A lot of these people, they start with us because they want to grow their channel. But in the going through our process, they're like, oh, you've pulled out this mission to me. It's not just about views. It's not just about subscribers as if like, like every single view count on YouTube represents a real, actual, live, breathing person, you know, who's actually giving you the opportunity to speak into their life as a creator. Like, what are you doing with that opportunity? That's a big deal. And uh, yes, people can skip it, but that's because you're not offering enough value to that person um, or not in a way that they can more, most easily consume it. So like we, we pull that mission out of people and some of these people don't even know that they have this mission until they have like this light bulb moment. And they're like, yes. This is about like, like for example, working with Disney parks. It's not really about promoting the, the new roller coaster. This is about creating an experience that pulls families together. It's about creating those remember when conversations. Like remember when we did that? Uh, or or the, um, the debt consolidation software is, is about giving people freedom and hope. Uh, cosmetics, work with like beauty products and stuff. It's not really about how to apply mascara. It's more about giving women confidence and making them feel like they can present themselves confidently, right? So it's more about getting down to like the real, the meat behind it. And then internally, these are just real quick. We, we own it, we do it right. And we believe that, that the change, change is good. Let me give you a, an example of some of these. <clears throat> so. Uh, this is a few years ago doing a, a consultation one-on-one -on -one session with this lady and she had grown her channel very quickly she had almost a million subscribers over a million subscribers but um, uh, she was doing about six hundred thousand uh, dollars a year on her channel and making decent money and then it starts to plateau and it starts to go down and she doesn't know what's going on so that's why they hire us and we take a look at it and in this 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 session this is not part of our SOP, like our standard operating procedure. I just felt this is what like the Holy Spirit was saying, you just need to say this. And, I, and this is not a YouTube strategy I've ever used before or ever use again. It was like just in this moment, I, heard, I felt I was saying like, you should just say to this lady, like maybe as a person of faith, I believe the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. And maybe he just gave you this channel for this season of your life. And now like the season is over. I'm like, okay, I don't know how that's gonna go over, but there you go. Um, she didn't blink, and like no facial response or anything. I was just like, all right, that was weird. I <laughs> just kept going, right? Well, the next day she emails me and she's like, I have tears in my eyes as I'm writing this. You couldn't have possibly known this, but um, uh, my husband now is actually my second husband. My first husband died on our honeymoon. He passed away. It was one of the most tragic experiences of my life. And during that time, I had underlined that passage in the book of Job where the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And I'd forgotten about it and, until, you, until you mentioned that. And then also, somewhat my, at that time, I had a chronic illness. My medical bills were piling up. I couldn't pay for them. And uh, I thought, like, I can do a YouTube channel at home because she lost her job because of her illness. And, and so she's like, I really need this, this channel to work. And it grew and into $600,000 a year, right? And, and, she, and she said, and all my medical bills were, were covered and someone told me when it was growing, she's like, I think God's giving you this channel for this season of your life. And when you said, Tim, season of your life, that triggered that memory in me too. And I think you're absolutely right. My medical bills are kind of over and I'm moving on to a new phase. And I was like, people first, you know, just kind of roll with it. Like that's the type of opportunity that I just, I just love. It's like when some Hollywood executive flies me out to LA to have this big strategy conversation and we're sitting at a restaurant 
eating, the whole menu's in Italian, and I, they don't even put, like, cents, they just put lines after the numbers, you know, when you go those type, I don't know if you've ever been there, I don't go there very often, but it's just like a number than a line, <laughs> and everything's like way over my budget, but we start talking about, um, like, YouTube and strategy and online video and blah, 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 the industry, but by the end of the conversation, like, this, this executive, he's like, it's like, he's telling me about how his wife left him and he's sleeping with his other girl now. And he's like, should I leave this girl and go after my wife? I'm like, yes, you should. <laughs> like, go after the, your wife, right? Um, and I don't know how those things happen, but I think it's just the Lord saying, like, you still have this giftedness of Pastor Shepherd, and I want to use it in bigger ways than just inside this 501c3 church, local church organization. Um, you, you know, I get to speak in front of like Levi's and McDonald's and, and um, uh, Walmart and like these, these brands and influence their marketing campaigns. Instead of them trying to just like extract value from people, I can be like, no, 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 here's, what, here's how we're gonna do it. We're gonna actually provide more value to people through your advertising campaign. That will work better for your wallet in the long run, but I can make it like, so that these, even these big corporations are starting to thinking more about a giving type of way rather than just like an extracting type of way. So it's had a really, um, really, I just love that. Like I get to use my gift in this, even in those types of uh, those situations. Another lady, um, Someone we're working with right now, actually, she is a um, the voice coach for people before they go on uh, American Idol, America's Got Talent, and um, The Voice. So she tra she trains those people before they go on the show and kind of helps them out. And so she's trying to get her own brand going on, on YouTube, and she's got some success. But I remember my very first call with her, uh, she was. Um, I was like, hey, how you doing? And like, when I say that, like, I, I didn't say this part, but, like, I, but when I say that, I actually mean that, like, how are you doing, you know? And she sighs for a second, I'm like, no, really, like, how are you doing? And then we spent the next 15 minutes of that session talking about nothing about YouTube, but just about how she feels like her life is in this place that's so not very good right now, and now she's unfortunately in the hospital um, because of a lot of this, this stress and pressure, but like, just being able to listen to people and being there for people who would never otherwise go and talk to a pastor. They would never go into the church, but they would talk to someone who thinks that way and has that type of mission. Like this isn't just a transactional relationship where you give me money, I give you advice, see you, have a good life. This is like people first and actually caring, caring for people. It's our customers, it's our clients, it's how we manage refunds, it's um, how we, how we uh, spend time together uh, as a team. We have a two hour team meeting every Tuesday. The first hour is just like, how are you doing? What's going on in your world, in your life? Everyone on the team has an opportunity to share. We're holding each other accountable. We're talking about like what's happening in our personal therapy sessions, you know, in an appropriate way. Um, but it's like we're per people first. We're a team first, and then um, and we're even breaking away from our standard processes because it's good for people. So that's the first thing. Like my faith has influenced my work because it's set our core values and how we operate as a company. But um, here's another big one. How has impacted my my work. Um, you guys know what Sabbath is, but does anyone actually practice it? Kinda? All right, we got some honest people here. Good, I like it. Um, you know, it's up there with like, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't murder. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of a, it's a Rema Sabbath day, keep it holy. And <clears throat> when I first started my business, I was thinking, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I can't be fired again. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna be in charge. I'm gonna, I'm gonna grow my own business. Um, I am going to I have control and freedom over my time, over my schedule. There's no more any cap on my income of how much, no one telling me how much I can make. There's no bottom on it either, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, but there's no one telling me like how much time I get to spend away from my family this year to go on vacation and when, when I need to leave my family each morning and when do I get to go back to them each, each day. Like all that's gone. And, and so I was doing this for about a year when I first started Video Creators. And I loved it because I was driving so hard for that dream that I could never really take time off to rest because when you're a solopreneur just getting started, nothing moves forward in the business unless you're doing it, right? And if I'm not working, everything's at a standstill. And, and so I, w I thought I was gonna have all this freedom, but I was listening to the audiobook, a really good book I'd highly recommend called, um, t author's name is uh, Timothy Keller. It's called Every Good Endeavor. It's about connecting your work to God's work. And there's a chapter in there about Sabbath. And I was listening, I still remember <laughs> listening, driving, um, listening to this, and I was like, I had this moment, I'm like, oh, 
I am actually, I just exchanged one master for a different master. I, now my new master is I'm just enslaved to work itself. And I can't stop. <laughs> I don't feel like I, I can stop. And so I understand, I grew, I grew up understanding the concept of Sabbath, but it wasn't really practiced. Um, it, it, and, and it wasn't really like this, this big thing. It was like, yeah, we, that one's up there with like, you know, honoring God type of thing. Like just make sure it kind of happens sometime or whatever. Um, and so when I really started looking into Sabbath, um, what, what is really happening is, is like God in Genesis 1 and 2 is setting his rhythm for how we should live our lives. And we think of Torah, like often in English, that's translated as law, which is not wrong, but it's incomplete because in Hebrew, the word Torah actually isn't law. Like we think of law in our language, that means like police officer, go to jail if you break it, you know, type of thing. But in Hebrew, Torah actually means way of life. Right? And so God's like, this is, this is some guidelines for how you should live life. All right? And so we've been leading into that, including Sabbath. It's been so life-giving to me. My first attempt at Sabbath was just like, can I go 24 hours without checking my work email? That was it. That was so hard. The entire 24 hours, I'm thinking about everything that's piling up there. I'm like, it's not going to be worth it, you know? But now, like years, I don't know, we've been doing it for eight, nine years, something like that now. Like this is maybe 10. This is one of the most life-giving rhythms of our family every week. Um, this is from last summer. Um, this is my, my oldest boy down here, Ezekiel. And uh, he's cooking the burgers. We have friends over, neighbors over, families come on over. Uh, not every, we do it now. We do it every other Sabbath is an open house Sabbath. People just come over and um, we have a taco bar. We we'll bring something and we, and we just eat and uh, we'll go swimming. We'll hang out and talk, play some basketball, flip burger, you know, and it's just like this really communal life-giving experience. It's kind of, I'll be honest, it's kind of like what I wish the church was. <laughs> When I, you know, it's, it's like this coming together, it's praying together. It's, um, and what I realized is like when, when, when God set his rhythm for how we should live our lives, um, even before the, the Ten Commandments, he's like, he, he, everything else he calls good when he's making it. But when God sets apart Sabbath, he's like, and he blessed the seventh day. And that's like the only thing he actually blessed. And it's a span of time that he blesses. It's not like other things he's blessing like ob objects and things and ideas, but here's like a span of time. These 24 hours is blessed. And he's like, I want you to just rest. And if you ask a good Jew, like what is one of the most important commandments? They say, well, observing Sabbath. That's why the Pharisees were so hard on Jesus and the disciples about this because like if, if someone broke the Sabbath, like Moses goes, the guy's like, this guy's picking up sticks for his fire, little true story, for his fire, and God's like, put him and his whole family to death. And they're like, whoa, this is a serious thing, right? And so like, we're like, if this, if the heart of God is still like Sabbath is important, then how about we lean into that? And so our faith has certainly impacted um, this, this family rhythm that we have, and it's been really life-giving for us in so, so many ways. Um, and now the science is coming out that says like, if you just work and rise and grind all day, you will, I just watched a video about it from uh, Matt Diavella on YouTube. It's, if you could look him up, he just had the video just this past week, the most recent video is about um, the problem with time management. And in there he talks about like, it's not time management problems, it's an energy management problem because you have different levels of energy, different times of the day. And, and, uh, but one of the things he said is most important for focus and having energy is having a, is having a period of rest of 24 hours. I'm like, what? Right? See? Yep. <laughs> Says it right there in the Bible, actually. Kind of opens with that in the second chapter. But um, sorry, I get a little cocky sometimes. So yeah, so then how does my, my work impact my faith, because I think it's a little short. This one was a little bit, I had to think through this one a little bit more, because I think we all say like, okay, I'm supposed to bring my faith into my work, but like, does my work impact what I actually believe, right? And I, and I, I, think, it, I think it does, um, because it's, let, let me give you some examples. So this is a, this, is, this board is a plaque I built. It's, uh, it's not a plaque. It's, I don't know. It's a big wooden thing. It's like right on the, when we first walk in our house, I should have made it a little bigger so you can see in context. But it's one of the first things you see when I walk into our house. And this is kind of like for the Schmoyer, for our household, this is like our mission and some of these pillars, like key uh, or core values, if you will. And this one, uh, second from the bottom, is double resources. 
And my work has impacted my faith because uh, I take really seriously this, 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 this uh, story that, that Jesus says where he's like, hey, there's these, the parable of the talents where he's like, you got to go out. And um, he was master's like, I'm leaving for a trip here. You get, you get two talents, you get five, you get 10, right, or whatever. And, uh, and then he goes away and the master returns at some random time. And he's like, how'd you do? And the one guy, everyone doubled their resources except for the one guy who buried it. It didn't work out too well for that guy. But the other two were like, they're like, come into my kingdom, my master's happiness. And then he's like, the guy who attended, like, give that to this guy. That guy's going to double it again in my kingdom. And so I, I believe that the master is one day going to return. And he's going to ask me, like, Tim, what did you do with what was entrusted to you? And I believe that when he comes, he's going to be asking me, like, how fruitful were you, Tim? And as I enter into his kingdom, he's, I, I want him to even entrust more to me. That's a blessing. That's like, a, give it to this guy, because that guy nailed it, right? And so the more blessings that we have, the more we have to manage, the more I think that's a sign of God being like, you are being faithful with little, you will also be faithful with much. And, and so this for me really goes back, let me just read it to you. This is what's on our board. Well, you can read it yourself. You know how to read your college students. So, um, but what it really comes back to me is, again, back in Genesis um, one and two, when God creates man, the, the reason he, cre he creates him and then he gives him this, this mission, which is to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, reign and rule over it and subdue it, right? And I'm like, what does that mean? Like, what, is, like, what does all that mean? And, but I can boil it down to be like being fruitful and multiply. Like that's like the first thing he says is like, I'm giving you this garden. It's like a blank, blank canvas. I want you to care for it. I want you to nurture it. I want you to make this fruitful. And if I think about if God, the reason, like what was God's vision for the future? If that's the commission he gave to mankind, like I'm thinking like if Adam if it wouldn't have sinned and this would have continued to grow, then it sounds like he's actually like this would have turned into a city. And, that, and, and this garden that like covers the entire earth, you know, where he is like ruling and reigning. And then I have Revelation, I'm like, oh, it actually happens. There's a city, you know, it starts in a garden, but the story ends in a city where he's ruling and reigning again from, from Jerusalem. And I'm like, okay, so being fruitful and multiplying, like that's what he created me, that's what I'm here for. But I don't think of being fruitful and multiplying just in terms of doubling financial resources or just in terms of, of um, yeah, business growth or whatever, to me, and this is where it starts, like work, I'm taking it more generally now because I don't think we can just think of faith in the workplace as like the only thing because our, our, our commission is to do a lot more than that. Um, to us, this is like, we have acreage. Like, what do, how do we make this fruitful? And multiply and so we planted fruit apple trees blueberry bushes we got grapevines we have chickens who give us eggs but they also till and fertilize our garden during the winter and uh, eat all the bugs and the junk out of it so it's like perfect and ready to go in the spring and so it's, it's like our property um, it's like God's entrusted this property to us how do we make it fruitful with gardening and vegetables and we got way more strawberries than we can handle but but it's great because they are like candy it's not what you get in the store at all um, but it's also being fruitful like in my marriage and so my wife and I have a thing or like even if there aren't any problems we still go to a therapist because they're always our problems right you just don't you're just in denial until you get there, really. So it's like, well, let's, how do we make our marriage be fruitful? And, and how do we raise our children in a way that's fruitful? Like, it's all about reproducing fruit. And then the other way that this impacts is that it helps me know where do I direct my attention and focus my time and invest, invest my time as, in my work and, and, that, I, and that I do. Because um, I, this, this, like, be fruitful and multiply thing um, and then seeing like what, what happens when God comes and Jesus comes and, uh, to earth and we're seeing like he's healing these people and he's, and he's like uh, casting demons out of that people. And he's like giving all these like little glimpses of like one day, this is what the city is going to look like where I, when I'm ruling and reigning and you know, the, it's going to be every tear will be wiped from every person's eye. Be no more, like no more darkness and like all these, these pain, and he's like, here's a little glimpse of it here. Here's a little glimpse of it here. And, and so it deepens my belief that I am, like, when I direct my attention, my attention is directed towards restoring what is broken, which is what Jesus is doing. And that's what his entire kingdom is, like, is, is about, is like righting everything that's wrong. And so I am seeking the kingdom. And where can it be found? Joining in that work, whether it's like, my daughters here, so I took this picture literally this morning for this presentation, because I think about this every time, we have five daughters, every time I brush their hair, I'm like, I am restoring order to chaos. 
you know, <laughs> like when I do this. I literally am, and, and, and I'm like, this is a glimpse of the kingdom, right here I'm brushing my daughter's hair, where it was chaotic, it was a mess, and it was tangled, especially this one, but, because uh, <laughs> she sleeps on it right there. And, um, but, but, now it's, but now it's beautiful again, and now like, the, there's re- order being restored to this. So whether it's brushing my daughter's hair or helping someone spread messages that change lives on YouTube, whether it's making the earth fruitful or anything else, like, I don't think our faith can impact only our employment work. It should just impact all of our work. And like in everything we do, it's like how it how I direct how I direct my attention, my attention. Coming from Matthew six thirty three, this has been a driving verse for me. It says, "Seek first the kingdom of God." Or, well, in this translation, it was whatever it is. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And sometimes, like I think about like when I'm supposed to grow the king, like I, the words I grew up hearing is like you need to grow the kingdom, you need to expand the kingdom, or we need to build the kingdom or something. But I'm like, well, wait a minute, Jesus like seek the kingdom. What does that mean? How do I seek the kingdom? And I think that's what this means is like it's like looking for wherever His work is, wherever He's working. And let's join Him in that. Here's a YouTube creator who's got a message that I don't have. They're, this is an area of expertise for them. If that spread. Like, this could help so many people get out of debt. Like, uh, we're, Dave Ramsey's a former client of ours, like, helping that. Or maybe it's, um, like, if uh, um, this lady who's teaching people how to sing, like, she's going to give so many more people confidence and the ability to express themselves joyfully. Or, like, where is, God, where is God working? When I see those glimpses of the kingdom where rights are being wrong, where unjust things are becoming just, where lives are being changed, or in Adam's case, it's like where a blank canvas of a garden was given to him to work as a blessing before. Like, sometimes you think his work is a necessary evil, but I think it's important to remember that God blessed the work even before it, the curse came in, and the curse turned it into toil. So, um, so it's hard work, but it's still good work. Um, so, any, so I just think, like, God's given command is be fruitful and multiply to fill the earth, to do it. Um, and this is how I do that, is, like, we're seeking those little, it kind of, like, all right, I got kids, so this, just roll there for a second. You, you have, if you have a lot of kids, it's important you get a tablecloth that repels water, you know, because you want these little beads, like, the, you can just, like, blow it off or, da- you know, it doesn't, like, go over or make a big mess, okay? So we got one of these tablecloths that just, like, they spill their drink, it just beads right up, and it's great. So when I look at that, though, it's like they spill their drink, and, these, and all these beads of water, like, go everywhere. I'm like, okay, there's a glimpse of God's kingdom, there's a glimpse. One day God's going to come and just dump a bucket right, on this table, and it's going to be everywhere, and everything's going to be restored. But in the meantime, it's like my faith is impacting my work, and my work is impacting my faith by finding little glimpses of these kingdom, and like, how does my business come behind and amplify that message? How, where do I, like, where is God working, and how do I join Him in that? And it was really, um, all comes out, like, of a, of a personal mission of mine. This is how I define, like, what is, what is my mission? I multiply glimpses of the kingdom on earth by creating content, developing systems, and building relationships that equip others to multiply the fruitfulness of their lives for the kingdom. And so, like, this is kind of like my vision. This is my purpose. Um, this is what drives me in my, in my, in my company with, with video creators. All what we do in our property, with our family, like, it's all kind of birthed from this. It's like finding where there's chaos, restoring order, um, and, and just seeking, like, where, where can I join God in, in what he's doing? Um, but this isn't just my work. It's how I spend my free time. It's how I filter distractions and opportunities, because as you guys grow and get older, you will have plenty of um, opportun- distractions that are disguised as opportunities. So it's like really trying to decide, like, is this a distraction or an opportunity? Obviously, I'm here. I think it's an opportunity, right? So, um, so I don't think that this is what faith at work looks like. I mean, it could look that way, but like business re- self revolves around solving problems for people and hopefully making the world a better place and for someone or something. So I think like business in and of itself is a noble and worthy, fruitful cause. Like that's literally what we're doing. We're taking something that's unfruitful and making it fruitful. Someone's life who needs this problem and we're helping them solve it. 
I think it kind of looks a little bit more like this. Like this is our kitchen table as we, we get ready to, to celebrate. Um, and it's, it's like, it's, it's, it's also work, but it's also work you're doing at home. It's, it's like, it's, it's work you're doing with the resources you have, the experiences that have been gifted to you. It's the relationships you build. It's even your own well-being. Like how does your faith impact how you take care of yourself and, and your body? And, and especially for us, it comes down to like, making sure then that we have a Sabbath where we actually enjoy all the fruit that God has been blessing us with, that we've been working so hard to generate and to enjoy. And like, it, we, rather than just working, working, working for more and more and more like Sabbath, we're gonna just take, we're gonna take these 24 hours and we're just going to enjoy it. <music>